1925, a date which will live in horror infamy. Remember a time you were at the theater and you saw something that made the audience scream or jump? That was nothing compared to what audiences were in for when they went to see the premiere of The Phantom of the Opera. The production of The Phantom was shrouded in secrecy, and although film audiences had some idea of what to expect from Lon Chaney seeing him as Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame two years before that, they had no idea of how terrifying he was going to be in this movie. Imagine being in the audience, 1925, when The Phantom of the Opera was playing. That classic scene when Christine sneaks up on The Phantom while he's playing the organ and reaches up slowly, grabs and yanks the mask off his face to reveal that hideous phantom makeup that Lon Chaney had made. Women were fainting in the aisles, men were screaming, running out of the theater. It was a level of terror that has not been duplicated by an audience in almost 90 years. Though some have come close. The Phantom of the Opera would solidify Lon Chaney as one of the most revered horror icons for the next century. Sadly, in 1930, he died suddenly. But his legacy would return through his son, Lon Chaney Jr., who would become a horror movie star more than a decade later. Fast forwarding from the 20s to the 30s, film evolves, just like everything else, from silent movies to motion pictures with sound. And Todd Browning in 1931 wrapped up production on one of the most classic horror characters ever to grace the screen, the suave aristocratic Dracula, played by Bela Lugosi, 1931. Dracula was supposed to be played by Lon Chaney, and Todd Browning always had Lon Chaney in mind, but sadly, as I said, he did die the year before, so Bela Lugosi got the part. Bela Lugosi was playing Dracula in a theater adaptation that had been touring the United States for the previous couple of years, and originally the estate of Bram Stoker wanted $200,000 from Universal Studios to make the movie but he was instrumental in talking that price down to about forty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, which was a testament to his commitment to playing Dracula for the theater. Currently, there are over 200 movies that are either Dracula or vampire based. No other horror icon has been remade or re-envisioned by filmmakers than the character of Dracula. When Bela Lugosi died in the 50s, he was buried in the cape that he wore for the 1931 Dracula. Fresh after the success of Dracula, Universal Studios was raring to go with their next horror icon. They were going to do Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And because Bela Lugosi had done such a wonderful job as Dracula back in the day, they had wanted him to play the Frankenstein monster. But he looked at the script and he noticed that there was no dialogue. This was just a hulking beast that grunted and there was hours of makeup involved every day and he turned down the role he's like no 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 no. I don't want a part that has no dialogue and all this uh, makeup so producers had to find somebody else to play the monster and who did they come up with Boris Karloff Boris's portrayal of the Frankenstein monster won him critical acclaim and his popularity skyrocketed and he became the new godfather of horror and he would go on to you play Frankenstein again in The Bride of Frankenstein many years later. Only in The Bride of Frankenstein he actually had some dialogue. He learned as a child would and actually put sentences together, little two or three word sentences, but it brought out something from the character, gave it more of a soul, and you felt more for the character as he was being pursued by the townspeople with, you know, their torches. Frankenstein catapulted Boris Karloff and afterwards he would become one of the greatest horror icons right up there with Lon Chaney and Bela Lugosi. We, as horror fans in the 21st century, we owe it to ourselves to go back and revisit 
and restore and preserve those horror movies because if it wasn't for the movies that were made in the 20s and 30s with Dracula and Frankenstein and all the movies that made the templates for the great villains that run the gamut in the horror industry then we wouldn't have all this greatness that you see behind me and indeed the countless hundreds of other great horror movies that have been made since that time period. We owe it to ourselves to take homage to the original classics that made what we love now what it is today. My friends, I'm all out of time. Thank you for joining me. This is my first segment. I hope to do more. I hope to do as many as I can. But until the next time, class is dismissed.